Hello, Tansi Anin. Good afternoon. Welcome to APTN In Focus. I'm Daryl Stranger. Today, we're putting corrections in focus. Our APTN Investigates team is rolling out a four-part series on incarceration rates across Canada and zeroing in on issues that face Indigenous offenders in this country. We will speak to the reporters on the stories and find out what this series uncovered. Now, as always, we want you to join in on our conversation. You can tweet us at APTN in Focus on Twitter, or you can send us an email at infocus at aptn.ca. Now, before I introduce you to our first guest joining us here in studio, here's a preview of Brittany Guillaume's 2,180 Days, the story of Joey Toutsaint, who spent almost six years in solitary confinement. And a warning, this story does contain footage and discussion of violence and self-harm. We found terrible uh, outcomes with respect to Indigenous people in federal corrections. It's locked up all day. You go through a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of mental breakdowns. Thoughts, overrepresented in maximum security institution, uh, overrepresented in structured intervention units. Uh, all right, Susie, stay on the ground. Stay on the ground. He was in segregation for 2,180 days. Uh, they're also overrepresented in terms of suicide. In fewer than five percent of all of the placements in the structured intervention units was the law followed consistently. Um, yeah, I'm really struggling in CSC units. Don't know what to do sometimes. There's no help in there, none at all. Well, joining us now, like I said, in studio is APTN Investigates reporter Brittany Gio. Brittany, it's great to have you in and then chat with you. Thanks for having me on. So first off, um, what can you, why don't we start with you telling us about Joey Toutsaint? Yeah, so Joey Toutsaint, uh, he is a Dene man. Um, he's from Black Lake uh, First Nation, which is a fairly isolated uh, community in Northern Saskatchewan. Um, and so he grew up with all the traditional ways and beliefs of the Dene people. Mm -hmm. um, he was raised by his mother um, and his grandfather. And uh, sadly, when he was about 16 years old, his mom uh, was hit and killed by a drunk driver. And then about a month, a month and a half later, his grandfather passed away. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was one point in the interview with him where he said to me that if that hadn't have happened, if his, uh, if his mom and his grandfather were still around, he likely wouldn't be in prison. Um, and so that just really stayed with me. Mm. Um, and, you know, like going into it, um, I, I will admit that I had some preconceived notions about who Joey Toutsaint would be, um, you know, what his demeanor would be like, given that he is a dangerous offender and he's been given an ind indeterminate sentence. Uh, which means that there's no telling when or if he's ever going to get out of prison. Mm. Um, but when I got there, he was so far from any of the preconceived notions that I had. Uh, he was incredibly kind. He was, uh, he was very calm. And uh, his knowledge of the criminal justice system and how um, Indigenous people are overrepresented at every level right. of the federal system uh, really just blew me away. So going, uh, I guess, to the point of, of him being in prison, I mean, what, what did he initially get arrested for? Yeah, so his, one of his uh, initial charges was for stealing. So it was a, okay. it was a pretty minor uh, uh, charge. Um, and then it just sort of spiraled from there. Um, it, it was a lot of uh, institutional charges. Um, he was in and out of prison for a while while he was a youth. And uh, he's just been through that revolving door of imprisonment since mm -hmm. then. So then how did he end up in solitary confinement to, for the first time? So for the first time, um, I mean, going into solitary confinement, uh, 
It can be for a number of reasons. Uh, it could be for the safety of himself. Um, it could have been for the safety of the other prisoners in the institution that he was housed in. Um, but as I've come to find, it, the, the Correctional Service of Canada's response to uh, suicidal thoughts and self-harming behavior is to place the offender in solitary confinement so they are safe. Okay, so he's been he's been in solitary confinement for almost six years now, right? Like, what's that been like for him when when you interviewed him? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. As you can imagine, it's nothing short of incredibly traumatic mm -hmm. for him. Um, it, he spent 2,180 days in solitary confinement, and that's only at the federal level. That's not including any of the time he spent in solitary um, in youth custody, as well as at the provincial level. Okay. Um, and so when he is having, uh, you know, a bad day, uh, and he's having suicidal thoughts and he's exhibiting uh, self-harming behavior, uh, the CSC, the Correctional Service of Canada, will send in what's called the emergency response team, which is essentially uh, a SWAT team. Wow. And that's, that's the response to a mental health crisis. So there's you know people coming into his cell and screaming and swearing and throwing him to the ground. And so as you can imagine, you know, you're having a bad day. That's that's incredibly traumatic. Yeah, I can't even begin to think of, of what something like that would be like. Um, now, as, as we mentioned, so you did go behind bars to interview, uh, to interview Joey. What was that experience like for you? You had touched on it a little bit, but what was that like? Mm -hmm. So uh, I had put in the request to the Correctional Service of Canada uh, probably a month or two months before I actually wanted to interview Joey and it would have been about two or three days before the interview date that we got the okay to go ahead and so we just kind of quickly got everything together. I got on a plane, drove out to the institution from Toronto. It's about a two hour to three hour drive and it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful drive out there. It's right in the heart of the Great Lakes. and. Then you take a turn to go to the Millhaven Institution, and it's this stark contrast of beauty and uh, the correctional the correctional facility, which is you know it, there's guards everywhere. Um, it's it's completely fenced in. There's barbed wire fences, um, and actually, as we were driving um, on the property, um, a guard pulled us over. He and so as, as I rolled my window down to speak with him, mm -hmm. um, I look over and I see that he actually has a rifle in his passenger side. So it's, uh, it's exactly how you would expect it to be. Um, it's a maximum security facility, so it's, um, it's scary going in there. And was this the first time you had you'd visited a prison yourself? It is, yeah, it's the first time. Um, and it's, I, I hope it's the only time I ever go. Right. Um, yeah. So then, when after all of this, and, and you started learning more about solitary confinement and everything, what else did you sort of learn or find out about solitary within Canada? Mm -hmm. So there was a number of things that stood out to me, um, and one of the one of the things that really stayed with me was uh, the symptoms of solitary confinement, um, and that is uh, social withdrawal. Um, so. The Correctional Service of Canada is supposed to allow a prisoner to leave their cell for an X amount of hours a day. Mm -hmm. um, and what we see is that prisoners don't want to leave their cells, they want to stay there. Um, okay. And that's because there is no meaningful human contact outside of their cells mm -hmm. when they're imprisoned. Um, so then just 2,180, that, like, that's such a long time. Um, so was it just because you had mentioned um, the expressive self-harm? Is that why it was sort of a continuous time? Is that basically why he spent all of that time in solitary? Yeah, my understanding is that he has a number of mental health challenges um, and it, it angers him to be imprisoned. Um, and so when he is in solitary um, and he's exhibiting self-harming behavior, um, the emergency response team 
often is called in to, um, to assist and uh, it, it angers him. And mm -hmm. so it's just this endless cycle of him going into solitary, getting out, and then going right back in. And you had mentioned a bit of, <clears throat> excuse me, about, you know, he was completely not what you had thought he was, right? So when you were interviewing him, did, like, were, I imagine you felt safe and you felt secure during that whole interview. But like, could you just sort of explain for our audience maybe a bit more about um, what that process was, was like for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Joey, um, he, he was just a regular person. Um, he, he wasn't as you would expect a dangerous offender to be. I felt completely safe. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he was just really upset at his treatment in prison. Right. Um, and that was something that he tried to get across to me numerous times is that the treatment that he's experiencing is something that nobody should ever have to go through. Mm -hmm. Well, Brittany, we'll have to leave it there, but we certainly appreciate you coming in and, and updating us a little on the experience and, and who Joey is uh, and his story and, and, and your story uh, as well. So um, your episode airs, I believe, this Friday uh, on APT and Investigate, so our audience can certainly catch that. Uh, but Brittany, thank you so much for coming in. Thanks for having me. All right, let's go over to uh, social media now with our social media editor, Jesse Andrushko, to hear uh, what some of you are saying about today's topic. Thanks, Daryl. Online, we asked, what steps do you think should be taken to address the over-incarceration of Indigenous peoples in Canada? We received some good responses. Let's take a look. First, from Charles on Facebook. Canada needs a separate justice system from the political influence it has now. First Nations will not have justice until Canada has a separate court and policing system from the politicians. Hannah says, how about First Nations have their own police, courts, jails, treatment centers, etc. From Dean, at this point in the justice system, all we do is talk about how unfairly we are treated. It's just too biased for us First Nations people. Nothing will ever happen. Zachary said, start off by educating more Indigenous lawyers, judges, etc. and establish courts and our own police. Miss Mayer said, land-based restorative justice programs. Lastly, from Jennifer on Twitter, use humanitarian thinking and let the Indigenous people be seen as the proper humans they are. Thank you everyone for, co for commenting. If you want to share your thoughts, here's how. Send an email to infocus at aptn.ca, like us on Facebook on our APTN News page, or follow and tweet us at APTN Infocus. All right, we have to take a short pause here on the program. We will have plenty more on this topic when we come back.
He's in, it sounds like he's kind of frustrated a little bit maybe with, with what's going on. Yeah, he's, he's very frustrated. And uh, part of uh, he, his, his sentence was uh, a seven, life uh, seven, which means he could have got out on parole. <clears throat> Excuse me, could have got out of, uh, on parole after seven years. However, because he's not taking responsibility, uh, as corrections would say, for the kidnapping part of his crime, uh, he uh, would would never get parole. So uh, he could be in jail, as he says, uh, f still for a very uh, long, long time. And it is frustrating for him. He believes that uh, they they. Uh, over-exaggerated what he was doing, uh, you know, because uh, of the police overreaction uh, on that night. And again, uh, we go into that uh, in depth in the story. So can you tell us a little bit about how his background led him to where he is today? Well, that's that's an important question. Uh, part of part of the series and part of this particular uh, story, uh, we're taking a you know a thirty thousand view look at at corrections itself, and we're going to um, bring forward uh, you know his story, the history, the history of, of prisons, the relationship with uh, First Nations and the correction system uh, has been you know built on dysfunction, uh, systemic racism. Um, and that's something that is, you know, what we're finding, what the critics are saying is it's not something from the past. The systemic uh, atti uh, racist attitudes uh, uh, govern things uh, as, as we go today. So we wanted to take John's story <clears throat> and use it as an example, uh, have him tell his story throughout this piece. But uh, the broader uh, issue is looking at a very uh, extremely broken system that people f for decades now have been saying uh, reform, reform, and uh, just a glacial pace of, of change has taken, taken place. And there are people in jail right now who, uh, who are, are just watching uh, as this glacial pace uh, takes, takes place. So Rob, when you, you made a lot of really good points there. So when you had first heard of this and, and the Investigates team first heard of this case, um, ultimately, why did you guys decide to investigate uh, his case? Well, part of it uh, is the question, <clears throat> excuse me, is, uh, is he in jail uh, uh, on something he didn't do? I mean, that piqued our interest uh, uh, right away. Um, so that's one of the reasons we, we, we thought we'd uh, uh, tell, tell his side of the story. Now it's a 30 year old uh, story and, and it's, you know, it's, there's a lot of he says, she said back and forth. Um, you know, this, he, he does admit that he needs something new, some new evidence to come forward for it to become uh, a, a case in which can be then retried because that's what he wants. He wants a new trial. He doesn't want parole. He doesn't want like he wants that, that designation that he kidnapped and threatened the the young girl stricken. Uh, that's as I say in the piece, the hill he's going to die on, and uh, uh, so that's uh, that's that's where where he's at. That's why we wanted to uh, uh, feature him in this in this story. And Rob, you again, you had touched a little bit on on my next question here and, and that's what issues does his case bring forward specifically um, when it comes to to cases like his and, and just as, as a broader whole yeah well I think almost every issue I, I, he he seems to have fallen through you know every hole in a social safety net that you possibly have to end up where he is I mean he admits to the things he's done and he's made he made his own choices and you know he he he, he says he's, he was a very violent man but on the same hand uh taken away from his family at, uh, you know at three uh, uh living on the streets uh bad bad influences who got him into got him into crime uh, not knowing and fully being aware of of some of the things that he did uh, that led him to be, being in a penitentiary at 16 years of age. Uh, so just some naivety that uh, um, uh, as a child, if somebody had, was, was around to guide him, you know, where would he be now? If he was with his family, where would he be now? He laments the fact that all his family are, are normies. They're, they're just citizens, as he calls them. 
and uh, he he uh, uh, just uh, uh, looks at a life if, if, if he could have been caught and didn't fall through one of those holes, maybe something uh, uh, could have been different in his life. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rob, you've covered a, a number of issues with justice and Indigenous peoples, uh, including wrongful conviction. And just with that, um, what are maybe some of the more pressing issues that continue to plague Indigenous offenders specifically? Well, again, I think that's something we get into in, in the story. I think over-representation uh, and why First Nations spend longer in jail, why uh, more of them are, are sent to jail in the first place. There's a uh, uh, um, uh, unintended consequence of, uh, of bringing in culture into the prisons, bringing in uh, sweats into the prisons. Uh, so there's suggestion that judges now think, well, maybe that's the best place for people because they have, they have access to th these uh, um, um, activities and, and culture. Uh, which is which is very bizarre, uh, you know. People, you know, don't shouldn't be going to prison to get their culture, you know. But that is one of the un unintended consequences of, you know, certain reforms that have taken place over the past thirty years. So those are those are just some of, some of the issues over representation and why our people are staying much longer in prison than than other people. And last one here for you, Rob, what are some of the experts and, and advocates saying about this? Well, uh, they're, they're, they're getting to a point where, of, of a complete uh, frustration uh, that uh, uh, Ivan Zinger, who just brought out uh, one of his uh, annual reports, he's the, he's the watchdog of, of the system, uh, s tells us that, you know, for, for uh, uh, 30 years they've been giving recommendations and he can't see one. It'd be, he says it'd be hard practice to find one of the recommendations that the, the CSC had, had followed. Uh, they're, 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 it's, it's broken. Uh, systemic racism uh, is, is still an issue. It's a modern issue. It's not something left over from, from, from the old days. The, the attitudes are there entrenched uh, and uh, our people, the inmates, are dealing with that on a daily basis. Well, Rob, uh, thanks so much for coming on here, and we certainly look forward to Hard Time, which, pre, which airs, I believe, on March 17th. So we certainly appreciate you coming on and, and giving us a quick preview and a little in, insight into what Hard Time is. So thanks so much. Thank you. The Cusan Sisters case has captured headlines across the country as we move on to our, our next uh, story here. Priscilla Wolf is updating their case for the correction series. The two sisters say they were wrongfully convicted for a 1994 murder. APTN National News has followed the story since a 2020 episode of APTN Investigates. That one was called A Life Sentence. Now here are some of the news stories we've produced on the sisters. In Yorkton, the bail hearing for the kids for the Cusant sisters, excuse me, is wrapping up. The sisters say they were wrongfully convicted of the murder of a Saskatchewan farmer. After spending nearly 30 years in prison, support from advocates across the country is pouring in. Tamara Pimentel has that story. On day two of a bail hearing and on her 51st birthday, Adelia Cuisance looks back at a lifetime institutionalized. I was talking to my oldest daughter, Haley, and she was mentioning, she was like, wow, mom, you're 51 today and you were in prison 30 years and four or five years in a boarding school, so I've been confined most of my life. She and her sister, Narissa, arrived at the Yorkton Courthouse Wednesday with support from family and advocates, pushing for the two to be released after spending 30 years in prison for a murder their cousin confessed to. Advocates Nicole Porter and Dan Godberzin partnered with Change.org to create a petition to free the Cuisant sisters. They've so far received over 60,000 signatures. We wanted the country as a whole to know how many concerned citizens there are. Uh, and we would like to see ultimately uh, the justice minister in Saskatchewan make attempts at reconciliation here. So our big goal was to deliver uh, these signatures to her. Godrezin wasn't successful in submitting the petition while spending Tuesday outside the Saskatchewan legislature. 
But signatures are still rolling in from across the country and some from the states. I'm here for the sisters, the miscarriage of justice. This is 30 years and um, it's just deplorable. Senator Kim Pate used to be the executive director of the Elizabeth Fry Society supporting women in jail. She said she met the sisters when they were first incarcerated. So what's really important for people to know is all of those breaches in almost every case they were continuing to live their lives. They were contributing to the community. I mean, when, a, when Narissa was unlawfully at large for over two years, she was actually working with people in the downtown east side. She was sheltering animals and fostering them. She was, uh, she was working. She was not posing a risk to public safety. And that what the judge has to look at is, will releasing these two women on bail pending the review of their wrongful convictions result in a risk to public safety? And the, I think the very clear answer is no. The judge won't be making a decision for at least another month, but Azealia says she refuses to give up hope for a positive outcome. This should be reconciliation today. And I always still believe in my heart that everything's going to work out today. And I just keep praying every day. My team wouldn't be here if they didn't believe we were innocent. So I'm praying. Well, Priscilla joins me now from Saskatoon to update the story. Priscilla, it's great to see you and talk to you. I understand you've been uh, working on an update to this case. So what is the latest here? Hi, Daryl. Yes, thanks uh, for, uh, you know, letting me discuss this um, story today. And, uh, you know, since Tamara um, um, did the story last month in January, or sorry, two months ago, uh, I had met up with Odelia and... Um, because the the justice um, said that he didn't want to make a decision until he returned from vacation, he had set a date for February twenty third. Uh, we did. I did go. APTN did go to the court hearing, and again at the court hearing, Justice uh, Lay said that he still needed more time to review. And the good thing about it is one of um, Odelia and Nerissa's lawyers, Deanna Harris, said that. You know, at least he's taking his time. And um, what he did was he set a court date for March 27th. He may make a decision before then. And if he does, he'll let people know. And um, for now, you know, we're waiting till March 27th. And hopefully both of the sisters can attend. Well, you've spent a number of days working with the sisters and, and Odelia specifically last month. So how is she doing and, and how are they doing? Well, yeah, I didn't get to uh, meet Narissa in person, and um, I did meet Odelia, and, you know, she's hopeful. She's very hopeful, and the, the thing about her is, um, you know, she's patient, and she she's very supportive of her sister, helping her sister stay positive because, you know, she's the older sister. And David Milgard, you know, who had who's passed away, he was a very strong advocate for the sisters. And Odelia mentioned, you know, she feels his spirit there. And even when she was at court in February on the 23rd, she said she felt his spirit there and it really helped her stay hopeful. Well, you mentioned a little bit about this uh, earlier, Priscilla, but the sisters are they're awaiting bail now, right? So um, when will they know what's going to happen? Is it that date on March 27th or, or you mentioned it, it could be before, right? Right, it could be before. Um, it probably will be March 27th. Let's hope that they do get um, a decision on that date because they've already waited, you know, a couple months now. And, you know, it's, you know, it's, I guess it's really hard for them as well as all the people that, you know, are advocating for them and their family and friends. So hopefully March 27th is the day. Maybe it'll happen sooner though. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I had mentioned in the intro about um, the, the previous APT Investigates episode that aired in 2020. Uh, how much influence did that episode have in publicizing the case and, and making people aware of what's going on in, in this case? Well, you know, that was a very uh, intense episode, or two episodes, actually. And I think it got a lot of attention. Um, up until then, you know, Odelia had told me when I met up with her in person that she spent a lot of time trying to write to people, trying to write to FSIN, trying to write to lawyers, asking for help, asking them to just look at her case, to consider her case. And when the episodes aired on APTN Investigates, 
people took notice. Advocates across the country, Innocence Canada, David Belgard, and uh, the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples, Change.org, and you know even some um, retired past uh, judges. So we've they've gotten a lot of attention because of that, because of the investigate um, two piece story that aired. And Priscilla, a lot has happened obviously since that episode aired and, and a lot's been going on recently as well. Are you able to sort of walk us through what's happened since then and, and maybe not every detail but sort of a, a general overall um, what's, what's gone on? Well, that aired in 2020 and since then um, Narissa, um, I guess she's in BC, she's, um, she's in um, jail in BC. But Odile has been out on uh, day parole for about a year now, and she's been doing very well. She was um, in Winnipeg and is now in Saskatchewan to be closer to her family, and she's on day parole. And in um, you know last year, 2022, she was able to go to Ottawa to plead for her freedom to the Minister of Justice and. The good news is that she did get a response and her lawyer or their lawyer was able to apply for a ministerial review and that's what they're waiting for and that was done in late December of 2022 and that's why they had the bail hearing in January because ministerial reviews can take years so while they're waiting you know their lawyers their defense lawyers want them to be out on bail and that's kind of what that's where we are right now and we're just waiting to find out what's going to happen and if they're going to get out on bail and then after that it's still waiting for the review to happen okay so still lots to to be waiting on it sounds like um priscilla wrongful convictions are, are really hard and, and tough to prove so who's in their corner fighting for them well, we know that uh, Innocence Canada, the Congress of Aboriginal People, um, specifically um, National Vice Chief Kim Bowden, Change.org, uh, Nicole Porter, she has a petition with over 60,000 signatures. And um, there's a lot of people, I think, that are aware of what's going on. And a lot of it is because of the APTN coverage, but other media have been covering it. So it seems like they do have a lot of advocates and people waiting to find out what will happen and hoping that they'll be free, including their family and friends, of course. And given everything that's, that's been going on, how has Saskatchewan responded to all of this? Well, unfortunately, um, you know, they didn't get what they, the answers that they wanted from Saskatchewan, um, you know, the uh, their lawyers, what, they did get was Saskatchewan Justice wrote to the defense lawyer saying that the Crown does not see a reason to reconsider the verdicts of the sisters, but they are cooperating with the review. Okay, we'll keep that in mind. Uh, Priscilla, we'll have to leave it there, but we certainly appreciate you coming on uh, APTN and Focus here today and, and sharing a bit of what your episode is and, and again, more of the QZN sisters stories. So thank you so much uh, for coming on. Your episode airs, I believe, on March 24th. And it's titled The Long Road Home, right? So we yes. can look forward to that. So thanks so much, Priscilla. All right, we have to step aside one more time here on APTN In Focus. We're not quite done, though. We still have another interview to come. Join our conversation now. Like us on Facebook on our APTN News page. Follow or tweet us at APTN in focus and send your thoughts to infocus at aptn.ca.
Welcome back to APTN In Focus. Tom Fenario is the newest member of the APTN Investigates team. He was the longtime producer of APTN's French newscast, Nouvelle Nationale. Tom's episode, The Prison Within, is still currently in production, and it looks like, uh, sorry, it looks at the Special Handling Unit, uh, Canada's only supermax prison for inmates too dangerous even for maximum security. And Tom joins us now to talk about this. Tom, hi, how are you? Hi, Daryl. Thanks for having me. So I want to start off just with the distinction of what is supermax versus max. Right. Um, so as you mentioned, there's only one in Canada. It's about uh, 50 kilometers north of Montreal. And uh, as you also mentioned, it's called the Special Handling Unit, or also known uh, by its acronym SHU, S-H-U. Uh, but despite its very innocent sounding name, uh, SHU, it's actually uh, pretty harsh, the conditions there. Inmates are spend upwards of 22 hours a day in a cell, sometimes more if there's a lockdown. And when they do leave their cell, they are frequently in uh, difficult conditions with other dangerous offenders. Let's not mince words. If you're in the uh, if you're in the shoe, you're there for a reason. You might have hurt a guard. You might have hurt another inmate. Uh, but often, people who are there are, are troubled. And um, one of the things about the special handling unit is you get less services, uh, less mental health support, and um, uh, so it's a. Uh, difficult place for difficult people and uh, many of the people in there are indigenous and they're not getting uh, services that are, are offered to them which is um, kind of a, a big part of my story. Well Tom I understand you've spoken to former inmates of, of the SHU um, so what did they have to say about their experience? Uh, definitely not a four-star Google review let me tell you that uh, some of them uh, wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy is a direct quote. Um, horrible um, one uh, inmate described to me in detail uh, being stabbed there, despite the increased security measures. Uh, but sometimes it's a little bit more, um, not as violent as that. Sometimes it's just the idea of spending so much time by oneself is incredibly difficult for, uh, for mental health. Um, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of people are there because of mental health issues, and there's a, very much a lack of services for people there who perhaps are the ones who need it most. Um, it's not just, Inmates or former inmates are telling me this as well. Uh, Senator Kim Pate uh, has been on the record as saying that the SHU violates uh, the Mandela Rules, which is the um, UN Convention for the Humane Treatment of Prisoners. Um, yeah. And Tom, can you, just going back to, to the distinction a little bit here, can you explain a little bit more about how the, the security classification works? Right, okay, so. Um, Indigenous and black men are placed at maximum security institutions at twice the rate of other offenders. And this is important to know because when you are moved up from say medium to maximum or maximum to the shoe, you get less services. And we, we know that services, especially uh, services for indigenous uh, offenders is an important part of the rehabilitation. And one of the things that I hear a lot is that everybody in Canada, almost everybody in Canada who is incarcerated gets out eventually. The numbers are somewhere between 80 and 90%. And who are we sending back out into the world is a very, and who are we sending back out into indigenous communities is a very important question that um, my story aims to answer. And uh, when you have things like people spending up to 22 hours a day in jail, not getting services, uh, violence, uh, constantly um, not getting training for wor uh, work outside of prison, um, it adds a lot, right? And um, mm -hmm. when you get sentenced to prison, there's a, an algorithm that decides where you are placed in security. Uh, it's called the custody rating scale. Um, and so you have an algorithm that decides where you go. And several reports have shown that this algorithm can be biased towards black and indigenous prisoners. Um, and on top of that custody rating scale, uh, corrections authorities are allowed to override it. So they are, if, if, if a custody rating scale says you can go into uh, minimum security, Correction staff can actually say, uh, you know what, uh, I think you even deserve to be in a higher uh, rating scale. And uh, the Auditor General of Canada did a study that shows that uh, correction staff overrode up to 46% of minimum security placements for Indigenous offenders, the higher levels, compared with like 33% for non-Indigenous offenders. So there needs to be a lot more oversight in terms of just like, who goes where? Because as we've discussed a bit, like where you end up depends what kind of services you get. And what kind of services you get depends on what kind of person you are when you are released back into society. 
That's a really good point. I'm, I'm really glad that you were able to, to clear that up and I'm, me and I'm sure a lot of other people weren't actually aware that something like that happens. Um, so it, as part of your story too, Tom, um, you visited a, an indigenous healing lodge uh, as well. So what is that used for here? Yeah, so uh, there are actually two kinds of indigenous healing lodges in, uh, in, in Canada. There are those that are run by Corrections Canada and there are those that are actually independent but con contracted by um, Corrections Canada. And um, they're called healing lodges and what they are actually is minimum security prisons. Um, so it's often a place where people go to finish off their sentence, indigenous folks obviously. And um, reports have shown that they are very efficient. They work really well. It's a great way to help ease people back into society. Um, what's uh, The one I went to go visit is called Wessaskun. It's about two hours north of Montreal. And um, what, what, what is important about what Wessaskun and other healing lodges do is that they uh, provide uh, elders, uh, sweat lodges, um, medicine rooms. Um, like you just basically like, I hope you, if you, if you work there, you basically, you can't be allergic to sage because sage is just burning constantly. And what's important is that, um, folks don't get this regularly in, uh, even medium, forget maximum or the shoe. And so, um, I spoke to folks who, uh, who worked there. I spoke to a man who was finishing off his sentence there and they both talked about the benefits of this, but I, did, I didn't even have to take their words for it because lots of reports have shown that healing lodges are a great way to reintegrate indigenous folks back into society and back into their communities. And uh, some of the questions that my story will look into getting into is like, uh, can we maybe have healing lodges that are medium security so we can get people into them sooner? And one right. thing that's incredibly difficult that was shown in the last um, uh, correctional uh, ombudsman report is that uh, the beds there are, are in healing lodges across Canada are only 50% full. And the one that I went to go visit is in fact only 50% full. So you have these beds sitting empty and uh, the place I went to go see, Wasis Kun, like the roof needs to be repaired, but they get paid per offender and they have people on a waiting list and they have beds sitting empty. And meanwhile, they need to fix things. They need, they need money, they need a budget. And uh, there's no lack of people who need these services. So how do we get these beds that have been proven to work more full and more frequently uh, is an important question that my story wants to get into. So yes, we start off with like the super max and these incredibly harsh um, conditions that folks are, are in, but it also aims to look into like the solutions and, and frankly, why the solutions seem to be not used as much as they could be. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tom, who else have you spoken to uh, for, for this story and, and for, <laughs> for some information? Well, uh, I, I probably should mention that the uh, special handling unit, the SHU, is a part of a class action lawsuit. So um, I've spoken to uh, folks who are former and even current inmates of the SHU, uh, but I have, I have to hide their identities because of the class action lawsuit of which they're part of. I've spoken to uh, their lawyer. Uh, I've spoken to a criminologist. I, um, I've spoken to a uh, former inmate who uh, has been released into society, um, and he is... Uh, He's a year in, and uh, I think what's interesting about his story is that he serves maybe perhaps as a cautionary tale, uh, as, as someone who perhaps could have been rehabilitated quicker if we'd done things a bit differently. But at the same time, he's kind of a success story too, in the sense that he's been out for a year, he's working, he's acquired skills, um, and he hopes to be able to go back and visit his home community uh, for the first time in uh, decades, eventually. So. Uh, and I, I even have an interview, to be honest, I, I'm still shooting my story, so it's almost a little unfair that you guys are making me come on and talk about it, but I'm doing my best here. I have, a, uh, I have an interview on Friday with uh, Corrections Canada to ask them some of the questions that I'm raising here right now and be like, um, for lack of a better word, what's up, guys? Mm -hmm. Well, we certainly appreciate you uh, coming on, even though it is still in production. Just one more for you, Tom, before I let you go and, and get back to, to getting this thing ready to go. Um, just sure. out of curiosity aspect here, what was getting access to the shoe like? Was it difficult? Was it like, how was the access uh, portion of that? I, unfortunately, I have not gotten access to the shoe. I, I am waiting on official response, but to be honest, I don't have my hopes up. I don't think they're gonna let me in. Um, so uh, basically a lot of my interviews with folks have been done uh, via um, video chat uh, through lawyers. Uh, it is a super max, so I understand that there may be, um, you know, security issues. Mm -hmm. um, but Corrections Canada, 
you know, like many public agencies, are not the most uh, transparent places in the world. And um, so I, I, I guess one thing I, I ask myself a lot is like, we have this question of like, yes, um, people need help and they need services for the rehabilitation, but also, um, you know, guards and staff deserve to be in secure places too, right? They shouldn't have to worry about being uh, injured mm -hmm. or hurt at work too. And um, I guess one thing I hope to pose, a question I hope to pose to folks is like, is there not like, can we not have a balance or, or, or an in-between here? Can we not get a little bit more you know, um, services for folks who perhaps need them the most without compromising the security of others. I think right. that's a, a worthy question. Yeah, that's a great point, Tom. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll let you go and get back to producing this. Uh, your episode airs on March 31st, I believe, right? So uh, The Prison Within is, is the yep. title of it. So Tom, we really appreciate you coming on and we look forward to your episode and, and all the episodes. Always a pleasure, Daryl, thanks. Now the four part series starts this Friday, March 10th at 6.30 Eastern, and that's right after APTN National News. So you can be sure to stick around and check that out. And with that, that is all we have for you this week on APTN In Focus. Now today's episode will be available as a podcast. You can listen and subscribe on aptnnews.ca slash podcast, or find us on your favorite player. And if you missed any of our past episodes and you want to catch up, you can find them and more on aptnnews.ca slash in focus. A big thank you to the amazing journalists from APTN Investigates for joining us this week and to you as well for tuning in. And we certainly look forward to those stories. I'm Daryl Stranger. Have a great afternoon. As part of our look inside corrections, APTN Investigates has been given special access to the Millhaven Institution. Their maximum security unit is considered one of the most dangerous places in Canada's prison system. Approximately 500 inmates are incarcerated at Millhaven, and we're here to speak with one of them. Hey, Jerry, how's it going? I'm good. Joey Toutsaint has spent his entire adult life incarcerated. He first entered the legal system at the age of 15 on minor charges. He's now 36 years old. He's loved up all day. He goes with a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of mental breakdowns, suicidal thoughts, self harming and I try to reach out to mental health, but mental health don't work, don't help at all. And I've been slashing up a lot. Isolation, self-harm, suicide, all are more likely to occur with Indigenous inmates. And I've been slashing up, and I just after that, they, they, the guard called told me to kill myself one night, and I cut my neck open. Indigenous inmates continue to be overrepresented at all levels of Canada's criminal legal system. Labeled a dangerous offender after a robbery conviction in 2009, Joey now has an indeterminate.